Oh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Zhang Shuya. So it's my great, uh, great pleasure to be here today to give you a, a brief introduction to Situ Jiarong, um, a Sino-Tibetan language with conservative and complex phonology and uh, uh, morphology. So the presentation is divided into three parts. I'll start by some background information uh, of this language. Then the second and the third parts will be a sketch of the um, phonology and the verbal morphology. So the name Jiarong, uh, which comes from Tibetan and the warm agricultural region of the Qin, it's polysemous. Um, historically, it means the region once ruled by the 18 local chieftains during Ming and Qing dynasties. Um, nowadays, um, the term is more often uh, uh, used to refer to the inhabitants of the historical Jiarong region. So they are officially identified as the Jiarong Tibetans by the PRC government. And finally, the term in, can also be used to designate a very archaic group uh, in the Sino-Tibetan family, that is the Jiarongic languages. These languages are distributed in the mountainous area in southwestern China, so mainly in Ngawa and the Gamzi autonomous prefectures uh, in Sichuan province. So the Jiarongic group is composed of three branches. Um, we have the West Jiarongic, uh, Northern and Eastern Jiarong languages. So the Eastern Jiarong has an, another name that is Situ. So Situ and the Northern Jiarong uh, languages are more closely related to each other and form the Ko Jiarong subgroup. So the language that we focus on in today's talk is the Situ, uh, the Eastern Jiarong. The name Situ comes from Chinese uh, Situ Si, which means the four local chieftains so Situ language means the language of the four uh, chieftains. Um, among the three branches in the Jiarongi group, Situ is the most uh, widely distributed one here. So with the largest number of speakers and it also has great internal dialectal diversity. It can be further divided into the Northern dialects and the uh, Southern dialects. So the Northern dialects are mainly uh, distributed in Barkham County along the Somong River here. So it is the core uh, region of the Jiarong languages. So these dialects are currently well studied um, for which we have already some very detailed grammars. Southern Situ dialects are, are distributed in the South. So in Zanla, Chuchen counties in Ngawa, and some parts of Danba County in Gamze Prefecture, but the southern dialects are currently understudied. According to the dialectological um, research of Gates, so the number of Situ speakers, um, I mean both northern and southern dialects, so the number is around 67 uh, to 73 thousand. However, due to the internal diversity, language vitality may vary according to different dialects. Um, but in general, northern Situ dialects are generally unsafe or definitely endangered. These dialects are used mostly by parental generation or up. So they are still transmitted to younger generations, but are only used by some children and mainly at home. Normally, the children only have a very limited vocabulary. Situ um, has a very long history of contact uh, with Tibetan and the Southwestern Mandarin. For example, there are early Tibetan borrowings, which, we can, uh, which can still reflect the Tibetan second postfix letter A. So like in this one, Chai-Lets, customs. So intense contacts with Chinese took place after 1950s. So today, the influence is from Chinese continue to increase uh, due to some social economic reasons. Um, I started learning Situ since 2015, so I focus on the Brawash dialect. So the name Brawash um, comes from Tibetan, which means between the cliffs. So this dialect is distributed in the border area um, between Chosyap here, a West Jiarongic language, and the Situ here. So as you can see in this map, there are six villages here uh, in the Brawash township. So the inhabitants here are Situ speakers. Um, there are another three um, villages located in an another river. So they are speakers of Chosyap. Here are some photos from my field work. So the two pictures show typical landscape of Brawash. So with steep mountains, 
uh, deep valleys or uh, and swift flowing rivers. So and the first one is a Situ house located in a very high mountain. So you can see it is surrounded by clouds. These photos are taken during my visit to uh, the uh, to Blauwaard villages. So the house is located um, at the foot of the mountain. You can also see the picture in the bottom right corner. Here we have a local dish, a kind of flattened noodle soup with fermented sour turnip leaves and sausage. So if you like, you can also add as much chili as possible. So just like the local people do. So now um, we are move on to the phonological and the morphological sketch of flowers. Um, this is a very special Northern Situ dialect exhibiting many morphophonological ambiguities. So it is not as streamlined as the other Situ varieties. So let's see it together. So Jarongic languages are known for their conservative phonology in particular for their complex initial consonant clusters. Situ dialects also share this feature. So here in Blauwarsh, Syllables with zero onset are very marginal, um, are only found with particular prefixes. Normally, a syllable contains an onset, so which can have one up to four, um, four initial consonants. So for example, uh, the second syllable of this idioform has a very complex initial cluster. So we, we here we have four initial consonants. In addition, um, at the flat at the inflectional level, due to the addition of particular suffixes, Situ also allow complex codas. Uh, for example, here, the first person dual form of the verb to tie up, it is pronounced as zgrobt. So here we have a complex coda of two consonants due to the addition of the dual first person suffix. There are in total 43 consonantal phonemes in Blauwarsh all can occur as simple onsets. But I think the most distinctive feature is that uh, here the plosives and affricates have a four-way contrast between um, voiceless unaspirated, voiceless aspirated, um, voiced and pronasalized series, um, which is a typical jarongic feature. But in general, um, the consonant system of Situ is simpler um, than those of Northern and the Western jarongic. Uh, so C2 has lost most, uh, most of the uvular consonants. There are eight vowel phonemes in Brawar C2, and the vocalic structure of Brawar distinguish three aperture levels, uh, high, mid, low. And at uh, each level, it distinguishes the central grade from the non-central grade. So the non-central grade includes both front and uh, back vowels. Here are some examples. So we observe that the mid front vowel a, uh, a has a conditional variant y before vela codas as in the duke. So the same goes for the open front vowel y here, which also has a variant y before vela codas. Mm, this can be actually demonstrated by some morphophonological criteria. For example, um, verbs ending in e like viet to do. So we are followed by the first person singular uh, suffix ng, which is vela. So it is phonetically realized as viang. So another criterion is um, vowel alternation. So we observe that, for example, um, e followed by a vela coda has the same alternation pattern as, um, uh, as a in an open syllable or followed by other codas. The distinction between the central and the non-central grade is fundamental, with, uh, um, which is the principal rule of vowel alternations attested in various morphological processes. So in Brawash, um, a verb can have two to four different verb stems, but vowel alternation only allow two ablaut degrees, so that is between the central and non-central grades. Here I quickly show some examples. The first verb, gashtas, um, is a two-stem verb. So we can see that the central vowel e in stem one shifts to the non-central uh, front vowel e in the stem two, stis. The second verb has three stems, but we observe that vowel alternations only happen between the central vowel e here in stem one and back vowel u in the other two stems. So the same situation is also found with the third verb, and the fourth verb, uh, fourth verb, 
So we'll see more details about verb stem alternations later. Tone and accent are also very important in situ dialects. So at the lexical level, Blawash presents a tripartite opposition between the final, penultimate, and initial accent. Final accent contrast uh, between a high tone and a falling tone. So here are two minimal pairs. The spi with the high tone means seed, but the spi with the falling tone means wheat bran. Gasso with the high tone uh, means to think, but gasso uh, with the falling tone means be alive. Penultimate accent is typically associated with uh, reduplicated syllables as in kajiji, sigada, and kaipalolo, uh, butterfly. Uh, words with initial accent are less frequent and are, mo uh, are often morphologically complex, as in this one, zgbona. In verbal inflections, the default tone of verb stems are subject to modifications uh, when adding different kinds of prefixes. So the phenomenon is called accentual mobility. Um, generally speaking, for a verb stem with the high tone, the, fin uh, the final accent moves to the penultimate when the conjugated form has more than two syllables. For instance, um, the verb stem nza with a high tone, when prefixed by ra in perfective, the final accent first remains unchanged in the bisyllabic form, renzang, I ate it. However, in the trisyllabic form, redenzan, and in the quadrisyllabic form, meradenzan, you did not eat it. So the accent sh shifts to the penultimate. Some prefixes are with accent, so the addition of this kind of prefixes neutralizes the tone of the verbal stem. For example, the sensory prefix na itself is accented, so it neutralizes the falling tone of the verb stem zi. So we have uh, um, a bisyllabic sensory form pronounced as nanzi, uh, sorry, nanzi, he or she, or, uh, or it is eating. From um, Trisyllabic forms, the initial accent shifts to the second position, and we have a trisyllabic sensory form pronounced as nadenzian, you are eating. So now uh, we are in mobile, uh, verbal morphology. So the verbal morphology of situ also reflects a general characteristic of the Hojarongi group, namely the polysynthetic feature with strong tendency to prefixation. But the non-concatenative morphology is as important as prefixation. So in dialects like Brawash, rich stem changes are what characterize their verbal morphology. In addition, Brawash has a unique feature that is the leftward spreading of the overcalism in the prefixing chain. So in example one, we have a verb stem containing a lexicalized intransitive divisor or here. So the vocalism all spreads leftward and assimilates all the three preceding prefix. So we got a form pronounced as monotokren. And this table shows a simplified uh, verbal template of Brawa Situ. The affixes added to the verb stem can be divided into three domains. So the domain closest to the basic verb stem is a series of derivational prefixes. Then we have the person domain including both personal prefixes and suffixes. The farthest from the basic verb stem is a tense aspect modality evidentiality prefixes, as well as two associated motion prefixes. So sentence two contains a complex verbal form indicated by the red color, but we can decompose it step by step. So this form is based on the root njik to chase, so from which we have an ambulative verb nanjingjik, to chase in all directions, de uh, derived by adding a, a prefix na and uh, reduplicating the root. Then based on this ambulative verb, we derive a causative verb by adding the prefix sananjingji, uh, cause to chase in all directions. Then we add the translocative motion prefix xia, so adding a translocative motion to the causative verb, which means cause to go to chase in all directions. Then the verb is conjugated for perfective, marked by the prefix ne and the stem two, sananjingjik. And finally, the, um, the conjugated form takes the closal nominalizer, ge, signifying that this is a piece of subordination. So due to the time limits, 
the folding parts will focus two aspects, uh, focus on two aspects, person marking and stem alternations, but actually they are associated with diverse aspects of verbal morphology in Blauage, so including the TAM and derivation. Um, finite verbs in Blauage have obligatory person marking. Um, intransitive verbs distinguish first, second, and third person, and the singular, dual, and the plural number. So although personal pronouns have an inclusive exclusive distinction here, this distinction is not expressed in verbal morphology. So person and, uh, and number suffixes are related to independent personal pronouns, but we also have two prefixes that are not related to the pronouns. So that is the and the. Um, it should also be mentioned that the second, um, the singular second person pref uh, suffix ne, um, it cannot formally appear if the verb stem ends in a in a stop uh, in, in a closed syllable. So there is a split in third person marking sensitive to TAM. In long past, Blauage distinguished between the dual and the plural third person, so marked by two pre two suffixes. Whereas in past, we only have a non singular third person indicated by the prefix. So here are two examples. Um, in example three. In factual non past, the dual, third, uh, the dual third person is marked by the suffix. But in, in example four, uh, we have a past imperfective situation. So the plural third person is marked by the uh, prefix g. Um, transitive verbs index two arguments. So the table shows the factual non past paradigm. So the row indicates patient and columns agent. So most, most of the person and the number markers are exactly the same as in the intransitive paradigms, but now we have four new affixes. So the forms with the first person agent and the second person patient are marked by a new prefix star here. And those with the second person agent and the first person uh, patient are marked by an additional go pr uh, prefix here. Second, the suffix u um, marked um, singular third person agent and uh, in a, um, similar to the singular second person suffix ne, u cannot be present after closed syllable verb stems. So as you may have already noticed, there is a prefix or present in nearly half of the forms in the transitive paradigm, including those marked uh, by the prefix go. So this is the inverse marker. The presence of the inverse marker O is sensitive to a person hierarchy, so in which the first person ranks highest, then the second person, and finally we have the uh, third person. So in the cases where the patient outranks the agent in the hierarchy, namely the cases of two on one, three on one, and three on two, the inverse marker occurs. On the contrary, um, the one on two, one on three, and the two on three forms are direct and are not marked. So here are some examples. Example 5a has a direct situation with a first person, um, with a first person acting on a second person uh, patient. So we have the prefix star, so one on two prefix star. But in 5b, we have an inverse case with a second person agent acting on a first person uh, patient. So we have the two on one prefix go containing the inverse marker O. So note that um, the inverse marker O also spreads leftward and assimilates initial interrogative prefix M. The principle also works in mixed situations. So um, 6A um, is a direct form and is not marked where 6B is an inverse case with a third person agent acting on a first person patient. So indicated by the prefix or merged with the preceding prefix, a uh, perfective prefix. In many other um, Jarun languages, like for example, in Japuk, the person hierarchy further distinguishes between uh, the approximate third person and the obviative third person. So noted by the, uh, noted as three prime. The opposition between proximate and obviative is often affected by semantic or pragmatic factors, such as the animacy of the referent. So in example seven, we have an animate agent, the boy, and an inanimate patient, pigeon skin. So the verb to hide is a direct form. 
However, in example um, eight, we have an obviative third person agent, the water, which is inanimate, and approximate third person patient, uh, which is animate, um, the boy. I'm oh, sorry, um, him. So the verb to take is marked by the inverse prefix were, so which is cognate with the prefix or in Blauash. Such opposition between the proximate and obviative third person has been neutralized in Blauash. Um, in Nai, we have an animate third person agent, she, acting on an inanimate patient, the lunch. The verb is a direct form and index the sing singular third person agent. And in 10, we have the opposite case. So with an inanimate agent, the herb acting on an animate patient, him, but the verb is still marked as direct. So know that in, uh, in 10, since the verb stem ends in a closed syllable, so the singular third person suffix u cannot be present. So again, we have the split person marking with two third person participants. So like the intransitive verbs, transitive verbs, uh, verbs also distinguishes between um, the dual and the plural third person in non past marked by personal suffixes. But in the past, we only have the non singular third person marked by prefix or. So in example 11, the plural th uh, third person agent, spiangenio, the verbs are marked by suffix ni uh, in the verb. So in example 12, the agent, gbai mundi, the two Han women are marked by the prefix or in the verb. So they are non-singular third person agent. So maybe you have already noticed that verbs in the person marking and paradigms appear in different stem forms. So indicated by the small capitalized Roman numerals here. So this phenomenon is called stem alternations and they're nearly ubiqu uh, ubiquitous in, in Brawash and observed in both inflectional and the derivational morphology. So I start um, by inflectional stem alternations, which occur in different TAME or argument indexation categories. As shown in this table, stem changes are actually as important as prefixes in TAME marking. So this, um, the distribution of stem one and stem two generally reflects the opposition between non-past and past. So, but we have two um, exceptions. The agophoric present selects a stem two, um, but inferential past, including inferential perfective and imperfective, selects stem one. The stem two is derived from stem one most often by tonal inversion. So, for example, gan part to sell distinguishes two stems. So we have the stem one part, which is with the high tone and its stem two is genera uh, generated by tonal inversion. So we have part with the falling tone. In example 13a, and the stem one part is selected for um, the factual non-past and in 13b, uh, which is a past perfective situation. So we can see that it is a stem two part that is used. For some verbs, tonal alternation is accompanied with vowel alternation. So for the second verb, garjik to run, the second stem, uh, the stem two, rjik, is derived by both tonal and vowel alternations. So in example 14a, um, the stem one rjik appears in sensory, and in 14b, in agophoric present, we have the stem two rjik. So nga or jing, I am running. In Brawash, um, a considerable number of verbs have more than two uh, inflectional stems. Um, this is different from most described situ dialects, normally distinguishing at most two inflectional stems. So verbs with multiple inflectional stems in Brawash are usually found with particular syllable structures. So we'll first take a look at of the verbs distinguishing the stem one prime. Stem one prime um, is sensitive to phonological environment. So verbs having stem one prime are with a high tone and either have an open syllable or end in stop coda. So in this case, the stem one prime is distinguished from the stem one um, by a vowel shift to the non-central grade in a high tone, non-suffixing environment. So here we have an example. So the verb to put on clothes is a three stem verb. 
So we can see that in the factual non past paradigm here, the stem one, uh, what with central grade is used in the forms with person indexation and suffixes. Since the verb ends in a stop coda, uh, singular second and the third person forms have no personal suffixes here. So in these two forms, we have the stem one prime yet with the non central grade. Um, stem two prime and is the opposite equivalent of stem one prime. So the principle is the same. Normally, um, an open syllable verb with falling tone is possible to have an additional stem to prime. So this time it is uh, the open syllable with falling tone, uh, the, the, the syllable structure. Um, the stem to prime is distinguished from stem two due, um, due to the tonal inversion from the stem one. So stem two in this case has a high tone. So in a similar way, inside all the forms um, potentially selecting the stem one, those without person indexation suffix will have stem two prime. So this can be illustrated by the perfected paradigm of the verb gavier uh, to do. So stem two va, va, with the central grade appear, uh, appears in the forms with person suffixes here. As previously explained, the non-singular third person of a transitive verb is marked by the prefix. So we have no personal suffix here. So this form, the non-singular third person in perfective, this form selects a stem two prime via with a non-central grade. Derivational stem alternations are, are, uh, are rare in other jargonic languages, but are frequent in Brawarsh. So for the derivations, um, for the derivations requiring stem alternations, um, the rule can be described as a primary unidirectional tonal alternation accompanied with vowel alternation. In the processes requiring alternations to the high tone, an open syllable or stop ending verb um, shifts to uh, shifts additionally to the non-central grade in the derived forms. So for instance. In the derived auto benefactive verb uh, to do for oneself, we have the high tone and no central grade. And the second example is an applicative derived by the suffix t. So the basic intransitive verb gate is with the central grade and the falling tone, but we have the derived form with the high tone and no central grade. As to um, the derivational processes requiring alternation to the falling tone, an open syllable verb stems have an additional uh, vowel alternation to the central grade. So for example, by adding the prefix sa to the verb gavie to do, we have the oblique noun sava, um, so the place to do or the instrument with which we do. So the oblique noun sava is with the falling tone and the, the central grade. The second example um, is a reciprocal verb, so this verb is derived by the prefix or and the reduplication. So it also presents alternation to the falling tone and the central grade with regard to the basic form, which is uh, with the high tone and non-central grade. So in summary, um, from stem alternation, we actually see different aspects of verbal um, morphology in Brauer Situ. So at the derivational level, the derived form may show stem alternations with regard to the basic form. Then at the inflectional level, different inflectional stems occurs in different TAME and person indexation categories. Um, moreover, since stem alternations in Brauer are also correlated with syllable structure, basically, if the derived verb has a different rhyme due to derivational stem changes, so it can have a different inflectional alternation pattern. Um, this can be illustrated by the verb gavier. So um, we can see the basic verb gavier to do distinguish the stem to prime, but the derived auto benefactive verb to do for oneself, um, this, uh, the derived form distinguish stem one prime. So I'll stop here. Um, the interesting aspects of Sutu are for, far more than those introduced in today's talk. Um, I think that the compl complexity of Jarungic languages are also the reason uh, why they are so fascinating. 
So I will end today's talk with this beautiful photo of the Vatican City, the capital of the Jaron world. Um, I hope that you, uh, one day you can also come to Vatican and feel the charm of Situ Jaron and also the hospitality of the local people. So uh, thank you very much and th thanks for watching.